The United States Air Force just conducted a test of what may become the world's first modern operational air-launched hypersonic missile out over the Pacific. And while I'm here to tell you about the test, I'm also here in part to say I told you so. Because just about two weeks ago now, I sat at this very desk and told you that the evidence was mounting, that the United States Air Force was about to conduct a test of the AGM-183 Aero, or Air Launched Rapid Response Weapon. This air-launched hypersonic glide vehicle was meant to be America's first operational hypersonic weapon. But after a slew of four consecutive testing failures, the U.S. Air Force announced this program's cancellation early last year. But since then, we've learned that rumors of Arrow's demise had been greatly exaggerated. And not only was this weapon going to continue its testing regime, but according to a report published by the Director of Operational Testing and Evaluation, a decision on whether or not Arrow would go into production would not be made until the testing was complete. Today, I want to dive a bit deeper into what differentiates Arrow from other hypersonic weapons, particularly those already in service, but also what differentiates it from other weapons that are often called hypersonic missiles, but don't actually live up to the title. And finally, I want to talk about what we know about this weapon's potential avenue to service, and why, if it does go into production, it would offer the United States a capability that no other nation on Earth can match. It's been a bit since we've gotten our hands dirty on hypersonics, and I can't wait. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Let's take a second to talk about today's sponsor, Ground News. You guys already know that Ground News is an invaluable part of my research toolbox. In fact, it's my first stop every morning because it allows me to create a personalized feed of news stories tailored to my interests. But Ground News doesn't just help me stay on top of current events, it also makes it a whole lot easier to see how our world looks quite a bit different depending on the political leaning of your preferred news outlets. Earlier this week, the World Happiness Report was released, based on data collected by the Gallup World Poll Survey. Then the United States dropped from the 15th happiest nation on Earth to the 23rd. And based on the data, we can see that that decline is largely due to a significant drop in reported happiness among Americans under the age of 30. Ground News makes it easy for me to see that there have already been 44 news outlets covering this story, including 14 left-leaning, 10 right-leaning, and 5 centrist ones. And as you can see here, left-leaning outlets ran headlines highlighting this decline in happiness among the youngest demographic of Americans, whereas many right-leaning outlets ran headlines that only emphasized the decline in happiness, sometimes framing it as a political issue. Now, regardless of how you feel about either political leaning, it's important to understand how the media we consume contextualizes the world around us, resulting in some pretty different perceptions of the world around us and the challenges we face, depending on the news outlets you prefer to frequent. Ground news makes it easier than ever to stay on top of current events and to cut through the political nonsense that so frequently divides us. And if you want to use ground news like I do, I can get you a great discount. Go to ground.news slash sandbox with two X's or follow the link in the description below to get 40% off the same vantage plan that I use in my research. Again, that's ground.news slash sandbox with two X's to get 40% off the same vantage plan that I use to stay on top of things. Ground News is my first stop every morning, and now it can be yours too. We now know that the Air Force's AGM-183 test launch took place this past Sunday on March 17th, launched from a B-52H Stratofortress that took off from Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. The B-52 appears to have flown some 2,500 miles or so to the northern point of the cordoned off area for this test, which would suggest that this was more than just a weapons test. It appears the Air Force was attempting to simulate an actual operational mission, which may suggest a high degree of confidence in the weapon itself. But to be honest with you, testing this weapon over the Pacific Ocean alone 
suggests a high degree of confidence, despite this test taking place in the Ronald Reagan ballistic missile test range, which is well suited for testing weapons of this sort. It's tough to deny the message testing a hypersonic missile over the Pacific Ocean could send to an adversary state like China. Now, just as we've seen with other recent aero tests, the Air Force has thus far opted not to disclose whether or not this test was a success or a failure. They did, however, release a statement that suggests the test went well overall while offering no real details about what this might mean for aero or hypersonic programs in general. I'll quote them here. The Air Force gained valuable insights into the capabilities of this new cutting-edge technology. While we won't discuss specific test objectives, this test acquired valuable, unique data and was intended to further a range of hypersonic programs. We also validated and improved our test and evaluation capabilities for a continued development of advanced hypersonic systems. Sorry for the interruption, folks. This is Future Alex coming to you from Friday morning while I edit this video. Not long after I recorded this on Wednesday, the U.S. Air Force announced that this test was indeed successful. They didn't provide any further details than that, but we now know that the final aero test was indeed a success. Now back to past Alex. Now that last part about validating and improving testing and evaluation capabilities is almost certainly in response to complaints lodged by the Director of Operational Testing and Evaluation in a report released earlier this year, where they outlined how Arrow's testing was largely inhibited by a lack of sufficient hypersonic missile testing infrastructure in the United States. There just aren't very many flight corridors that can support the testing of a weapon with a range in excess of 1,000 miles and a top speed in excess of Mach 5. And as a result, after one failed test, they might have to wait literally months to attempt another test. Now, I went into more detail regarding Arrow's previous testing woes, and if you're interested in that, I highly recommend going back and watching that video in full. I won't go through all of it again here. But it is worth noting that of Arrow's four known testing failures, at least three of those were not related to the Arrow weapon system itself, but were rather related to simpler things, like the mechanism that separates the weapon from the aircraft, or the connector bus that connects the weapon to the onboard avionics. In fact, during the tests where we know the weapon separated and its booster ignited, it seems as though Arrow has performed rather well. But overall details in general about this weapon's overall capabilities, or how it's performed by and large in testing, remain awfully tough to come by. Now, as I mentioned before, after four consecutive testing failures, the Air Force announced their intentions to scrap the AGM-183 in favor of diverting more resources toward another hypersonic missile in development known as the Hypersonic Attack Cruise Missile, which is a smaller scramjet-powered cruise missile that really belongs to a completely different class of hypersonic weapon. We'll get to that some more later. But suffice to say, the Air Force seemed to make it clear that this hypersonic glide vehicle we call Arrow was out, and the cruise missile we call HACM was very much in. But in the year or so since, there have been repeated hints dropped by the Air Force that Arrow may yet come back from the dead, depending on how it performs in its final all-up round testing. All-up round testing effectively meaning the weapon being tested pretty much as it would appear in operational service. All-up round testing is the final stage of testing before weapons move on to the initial operating capability. Now, in January of this year, the Director of Operational Testing and Evaluation released that report outlining Arrow's testing woes and highlighting that a production decision would not be made until the conclusion of its final flight test scheduled to take place sometime in 2024. And now that final flight test has been concluded, meaning we should expect a decision of some sort regarding Arrow in the not too distant future. Though how long it'll be before the Air Force discloses any decision they've made is anybody's guess. But by now, some of you are surely asking, what is Arrow anyway? What is a hypersonic glide vehicle? And what makes these weapons different from ballistic missiles or other fast moving weapons? Well, hypersonic glide vehicles are one of two classes of modern maneuverable hypersonic weapons. And while most people tend to think of hypersonic weapons as exceptionally fast, and they certainly are, 
It's not really that speed alone that makes them special. In fact, ballistic missiles have been traveling at hypersonic speeds since their very inception with Germany's V-2 rocket. And today, most developed nations have ballistic missiles capable of achieving hypersonic, or above Mach 5 velocities. But we don't call these weapons hypersonic missiles because there's an important difference between using hypersonic as an adjective and using it as a weapons classification. When using the word hypersonic as an adjective, we generally mean anything that travels faster than Mach 5, though that is mostly a rule of thumb. Scientifically speaking, hypersonic speeds begin when your interaction with the air that you're passing through actually affects the chemical makeup of the air itself. But that tends to start happening at around Mach 5, so Mach 5 is a pretty good rule of thumb. And in that regard, there have actually been plenty of weapons, spacecraft, and even aircraft that have flown at hypersonic speeds and could be considered hypersonic when using it as an adjective. All the way back in 1967, test pilot William Pete Knight flew the X-15 at Mach 6.7. America's Minuteman 3 ICBM, which has been around for decades now, breaks Mach 23 on its way to its target. The Trident 2 SLBM breaks Mach 24. And it's pretty likely that the Space Force's X-37B reusable space plane breaks Mach 25 when it comes in for a landing. To put it simply, speed alone is not all that special, especially when it comes to missiles. In fact, despite the high speeds hypersonic missiles can achieve, ballistic missiles can often reach their target faster. And that's because hypersonic missiles don't just fly fast, they also maneuver. And that brings us back to our conversation about the two classes of modern hypersonic weapons. Weapons that are capable of sustaining speeds in excess of Mach 5, while also maneuvering. The first, are hypersonic glide vehicles, which is what Aero is and is also the same class of weapon China's DFZF falls under and Russia's Avantgarde as well. Hypersonic glide vehicles can be seen as an extension of ballistic missile technology. You see, ballistic missiles are carried aloft via rocket boosters in a high arcing ballistic flight path. At the peak of that arc, the ballistic warhead separates from the booster and continues traveling down toward its target unpowered but at extremely high speeds. As I mentioned before, it's not uncommon for ICBMs to exceed Mach 20 on their way to their target. Hypersonic glide vehicles are also carried aloft via a conventional rocket booster, but they separate at a much lower altitude and then proceed to maneuver while gliding unpowered down toward their target. Now, how exactly they maneuver are closely guarded secrets, but it's almost certainly either moving control surfaces like a conventional aircraft or chemical thrusters like you might find on a spacecraft, or maybe a combination of the two. Regardless of how they change course, it's those course changes themselves combined with the weapon's high speed that make hypersonic missiles so difficult to intercept. Because the air defense systems tasked with shooting these weapons down track their trajectory and then predict a point further along that flight path to launch an interceptor at, sort of like leading a wide receiver when playing football. But if the missile were to abruptly change course after that interceptor had already been launched, well, those calculations are moot now and that interceptor won't come anywhere near the weapon. And you may not have time to calculate another intercept before the weapon closes with its target. Now, the other class of modern hypersonic weapon are hypersonic cruise missiles like the Air Force's In Development Hypersonic Attack Cruise Missile, or HACM. These weapons fly much more like suicide drones at lower altitudes and under power the whole way via exotic propulsion systems like supersonic combustion ramjets, also known as scramjets. To date, as far as we know, no nation has actually managed to field an operational hypersonic cruise missile, though Russia has claimed to have done so three or four times in the past few years and never managed to produce any evidence to substantiate those claims. So at least for now, hypersonic glide vehicles are the only kinds of hypersonic weapons we can confirm are in service. But even though Aero is a hypersonic glide vehicle, just like Russia's and China's hypersonic weapons in service are, Aero is very different because of the way it's launched. You see, Russia's avant-garde was designed to be carried aloft by Russia's new intercontinental ballistic missile, the RS-28 Sarmat, making it a ground-launched intercontinental strategic weapon. 
China's DFZF is a hypersonic glide vehicle meant for anti-ship duties, and it's also carried aloft via a ground-based ballistic missile. In this case, the intermediate-range DF-17. And like Russia's avant-garde, the DFZF is a nuclear-capable weapon, though unlike avant-garde, the DFZF was purpose-built to take out American aircraft carriers at extended ranges. And that brings us to the first important distinction between these weapons and Aero, because Russian and Chinese hypersonic weapons are considered nuclear strategic deterrents. These are end-of-day systems that you don't use until World War III has already kicked off. Aero, on the other hand, is a strictly conventional weapon. In fact, so far, the U.S. has committed to only fielding conventionally armed hypersonics. And that makes the testing and development cycle for Aero quite a bit different than its Russian and Chinese peers. Russia and China can both claim their hypersonic glide vehicles are in service far earlier in their developmental cycle because they're nuclear deterrent weapons that they have no intention of using anytime soon. In fact, as far as Russian state media is concerned, avant-garde's only ever been tested twice, both of which were successful, though U.S. intelligence assessments suggest that there was at least one more test, and that third was a failure that Russia opted not to disclose. Now, as I mentioned in our last video, that means Arrow has already seen more successful tests than avant-garde has seen in all. But Arrow is currently on the chopping block, and Russia has said avant-garde's been in service since 2018. And that really all comes down to the differences in application. Avant-garde's a nuclear weapon we hope never to see launched, whereas Arrow is a conventional weapon we can expect to see used as soon as it enters service. It's also worth noting that that difference between nuclear and conventional payloads means Arrow has to be significantly more accurate than either the Russian or Chinese weapons. A nuclear weapon has a massive blast radius, and as a result, you don't need to hit your target with pinpoint accuracy to make sure they're enveloped by the blast. A conventional weapon, on the other hand, needs pinpoint accuracy in order to have the desired effect. But we've already talked about those differences in past videos, and today I want to drill a bit deeper into the capabilities Arrow can provide the U.S. Air Force that no other nation can match, and that includes both Russia and China, despite having hypersonic glide vehicles in service. And a lot of that comes down to launch platform. You see, while Russian and Chinese hypersonics are launched from either subterranean silos or ground-based launchers, Aero is launched from airborne aircraft. In fact, if Aero does make it into production, it's already slated to be carried by the B-52 as it has been in testing, the B-1B supersonic heavy payload bomber, the B-21 Raider stealth bomber, and the F-15E Strike Eagle. And truth be told, if the Strike Eagle can carry it, the F-15EX likely will be able to down the road as well. And that gives the U.S. the ability to deploy these hypersonic weapons from just about anywhere in the world on very short notice, something neither Russian nor Chinese hypersonic missiles can do. In fact, you're really only at risk of getting hit by a Chinese hypersonic missile if you're within a thousand miles of one of their ground-based launchers. And you're only at risk of getting hit by Russia's avant-garde in a nuclear exchange. But American bombers like the B-52, the B-1B, and the soon-to-come B-21 Raider can depart from airstrips inside the United States and fly anywhere in the world, using air-to-air -air refueling to stay airborne for extended durations. And while you might be able to keep tabs on some of these bombers, like the notably non-stealth B-52, Arrow has enough range, estimated to be around 1,000 miles, or around 1,600 kilometers, to be launched from well outside the targeting envelope of even the most advanced surface-to-air missile systems. In fact, you could launch Aero from outside the reach of most combat air patrols. And that's before you consider the fact that Aero could also be launched via F-15E Strike Eagle, adding literally hundreds of aircraft that could leverage this weapon adversaries might want to keep tabs on. And considering the Strike Eagle already has a combat radius of right around 790 miles, just shy of 1,300 kilometers, that means an F-15E could engage a target some 1,800 miles away from the airstrip it took off from without even considering air-to-air -air refueling yet. All told, what this really means is that if these tests were successful and the Air Force ultimately decides to put Aero into service, it would provide the United States with a hypersonic capability that is 
utterly unmatched by anyone on the planet. And while Russia and China will always be able to claim that they beat the U.S. to fielding hypersonic glide vehicles, in the not-too-distant future, the U.S. could be the only nation actually using any. And again, that's because Arrow was designed to be a conventionally armed weapon with broad strategic capabilities. It's not a doomsday weapon to be lightly tested and then left on a shelf to point at whenever you're issuing threats across a diplomatic table. Instead, it's a conventional weapon meant for actual operational use. And it goes without saying that if the U.S. were to start using these weapons in conventional conflicts, well, then the U.S. would rapidly become the most experienced nation in leveraging hypersonic technology which will only inform the development of future weapon programs. But before we close, I want to address some comments that I always get whenever we talk about Aero as an air-launched hypersonic glide vehicle. You see, back in 2018, when Russian President Vladimir Putin announced to the world that Russia had fielded the world's first operational modern hypersonic weapon in the KH-47 M2 Kinzel, the whole world just sort of took him at his word and believed this weapon was as capable as he claimed. It wasn't until months or even years later that people finally started to realize that Kinzel wasn't a modern hypersonic missile at all, it was actually just an air-launched ballistic missile. In fact, the weapon itself is just an air-launched variant of the 9K720 Iskander-M short-range ground-launched ballistic missile that Russia started development on all the way back in 1988. Kinzel is an air-launched ballistic missile, and as we've already discussed, ballistic missiles do achieve hypersonic speeds, but they're not capable of maneuvering to the same extent as modern hypersonic missiles can. In effect, Russia just took advantage of confusion between the use of hypersonic as an adjective and the use of hypersonic as a weapons classification, and because most people didn't know that difference, they just bought it. Of course, once Ukrainian Patriot air defense systems started shooting Kinzels down by the half dozen, this became evident to most people. Really, all but those who are most invested in pro-Russian narratives. Now, it's important to note that intercepting a ballistic missile, or really any missile for that matter, is no simple enterprise. Patriot just happens to be pretty darn good at taking down ballistic threats because of three decades worth of research and development invested into this platform for that specific duty. If Kinzel had instead actually been a maneuverable hypersonic missile, it's not impossible for Patriot to have intercepted them, but it's far less likely. It becomes a much bigger challenge. And in fact, all of the posturing and hyperbole and analysis surrounding Kinzel back when we thought it actually was a maneuverable hypersonic missile could now very soon actually be true for Aero. You know, it's funny. I started covering hypersonic weapons in one form or another more than seven years ago now. And back in those early days, I was frustrated that it felt like everyone was ignoring this realm of weapons development. I kept writing articles about these high-speed maneuverable weapons that just kept falling on their faces. Nobody ever clicked on them. But then just a few years later, that turned on its head, and all of a sudden, hypersonic was a trending buzzword. Everybody was talking about these doomsday high-speed weapons that were sure to end the world, and how the United States could not match the technology being fielded by Russia or China. And I had to pivot in my coverage. Instead of trying to convince people to pay attention to hypersonic weapons, instead, I now had to rein in the hyper surrounding them, reminding people that these are not the end-all be-all weapon systems, and in fact, there are lots of situations where subsonic cruise missiles are a better choice. But then Russia's play-pretend hypersonic started getting intercepted over Ukraine, and everything turned on its head all over again. All of a sudden, instead of being afraid of hypersonic missiles, people were largely dismissive of them as a class of weapon, saying they couldn't be all they're cracked up to be because we've already seen how weak sauce Russia's are. But the truth has always been somewhere in between. Hypersonic missiles are not going to change the face of warfare. They're not impossible to intercept, and it's very likely that we'll have an effective means of countering hypersonic missiles in the not-too-distant future. But the truth is, air defense is an incredibly complicated enterprise, and intercepting anything, whether subsonic, supersonic, or hypersonic, is never a sure thing. 
The fact of the matter is, hypersonic missiles, if built affordably, can provide a huge amount of strategic and tactical value when leveraged in the right circumstances and with the right combination of other supporting systems and platforms. No weapon, no aircraft, no warship, no anything fights a war on its own. The real value in these emerging technologies is derived from incorporating them into existing and maturing combat strategies. It's all about identifying and then filling capability gaps in your overall strategy, or developing new capabilities that are never about just achieving objectives on their own, but rather about enabling other systems and weapons and platforms and personnel to achieve their objectives as well. And with the world's largest standing air force and the world's largest refueling infrastructure with tankers pre-positioned all around the globe and multiple platforms that can deploy this weapon, Arrow can provide all that, as long as it works. But right now, nobody outside the Pentagon knows for sure if it does. So rest assured, I'll be keeping my ear to the ground on this one. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.